So I'm supposed to be talking about what is conservatism. And uh, I would say, hey, look, just read the forward of my book. But I met this very nice guy at the cocktail party last night who said, who came up to me, and the first thing he said is, I want to ask you a question. What is conservatism? Because I've been trying to read that essay you wrote for four days, and I can't get through it. And, um, and I was like, which is not exactly what every writer wants to hear. Um, so uh, I guess I'll try to give it another whack, give it another whack, OK? Um, uh, it's kind of a funny thing. Conservatism is arguably the only political philosophy that actually has no ideological content. Now, that might sound weird at some place like this, but it's actually true. Samuel Huntington, in a famous essay written in the 1950s called Conservatism as an Ideology, pointed this out, that a conservative in America means something very different than a conservative in, I don't know, Saudi Arabia. Right? What does a conservative in Saudi Arabia want to conserve? Very different stuff than the stuff that we want to conserve in this room. Um, this is one of the reasons why I used to drive my dad, um, who was a passionate anti-communist, uh, batty whenever they would talk about on the news how the bad guy, how the people, in the, the, the ardent Marxists in the Soviet Union, the real orthodox guys, were the conservatives. Um, and it's one of these things that sort of leads to this tendency in a lot of way that liberals talk about stuff, that the conservatives are just the bad guys everywhere. Right? It's that, like sort of how Barack Obama talks about how the hardliners in Iran have the same views as the hardliners in America, um, which is profoundly stupid and, and fairly slanderous. But it's, it's this, one of these things that's very frustrating. And so this raises the question, what do conservatives in America want to conserve? Right? Which is very different, again, if you're a conservative in France, um, certainly, if you were a conservative in France or Portugal, you may want to conserve the monarchy, the role of, you know, the rule of throne and church over society. Um, these are very different things from what people in America want to conserve. And it's funny, if you listen to Dennis Prager last night, and I'm a big fan of Dennis's, and um, uh, you know, he talked about how essentially all good stuff comes from Western civilization. Now, I think that even Dennis would concede that this is a bit of an oversimplification. I mean, we did get algebra from you know, the <laughs> Arab world, and I can come up with a few other things. But as a general proposition, Western civilization is, um, the, first, is the first priority that conservatives are wish, want to conserve. So is traditional morality. So is the tradition of ordered liberty. And most important and relevant for this group and for this, this talk is that American conservatives want to conserve the ideals and principles enshrined in the American founding, the American Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. And this is one of the reasons why Friedrich Hayek, praise be upon him, um, said that, uh, that America was the only country in the world where you could call yourself a conservative and still be a defender and lover of liberty. Because what we are trying to conserve in America was very different than the European conservatives that he was contending with um, in most of his debates. What we wanted to conserve in America was a radical, classical, liberal revolution that said, in essence, that our rights come from God, not from government, that the fruits of our labors belong to us, that we are citizens, not subjects, the government, the government works for us, we don't work for it that we are, as John Locke would put it, captains of ourselves, that the individual is sovereign. These are the principles that come out of the American Declaration. These are the principles that come out of the American founding. And these are the principles that, um, that American conservatives broadly understood, at least in the political sphere, want to conserve and protect. Um, and I think, though, that this is what gets kind of weird about conservatism is that because we are not actually a coherent ism, like so many other isms, right? I mean, a socialist in France is essentially the same thing as a socialist in Belgium, as in, you know, in a, or as a, maybe even from Vermont, right? But they all basically, uh, it is a coherent ideology that is the same everywhere. If you're a true libertarian, you can be a libertarian in France, and it doesn't mean anything really different than being a libertarian in America or being a libertarian in Russia. But if you're a conservative, it's something else. And one of the things that I think really distinguishes psychologically, philosophically, conservatism from other political philosophies is that conservatives, broadly speaking, are comfortable with contradiction. 
And what I mean by this, well, I mean a lot of things by this, but one of the things I mean by this is that deep in the realism that Chris was talking about, deep in the realism of conservatism is this, it's a metaphysical, it's a theological, and it's a economic and practical bedrock faith in principle that we understand that life is about trade-offs, right? We understand that, the, that to have one good thing may, might mean that it has to come at the expense of another good thing. This is the essence of economics, right? The question is never, uh, you know, making the ideal, the choice, making the choice between the good and the perfect, because we understand, whether it's from a Christian perspective or a Jewish perspective, or just a practical sort of Tom Sowell-like economic perspective, that there is no perfection in this world, that everything is about trade-offs, everything is about compromises. And that's true in our lives. We have a finite amount of time in this world. We have a finite amount of things, finite amount of things that we can do with our time. And conservatives, at a very philosophical and fundamental level, understand this. And if you look at almost all of the other radical philosophies, whether you, whatever names you want to put on, fascism, communism, socialism, Marxism, thisism, thatism, it doesn't really matter. All of the sort of utopian political philosophies, they all basically boil down to the same sort of religious perspective that says we can create a heaven on earth here. That there's a unity of good things, that we don't have to make choices. If you listen to Bill Clinton or Barack Obama talk about things, they're always, they always like to frame things in these false choices where they say, I refuse to believe that we live in a country where we have to sacrifice economic growth for protecting the environment. Right? This is a fundamentally utopian way of talking about things, but it sounds like normal and practical. And actually it turns out that, yeah, if you want to get rid of the coal industry, or if you want to get rid of oil and replace it with giant blenders that kill birds, um, <laughs> It's going to come at some economic cost. That's just a fact. And, uh, and this, is, this is the point that my, one of my favorite philosophers, Eric Vergelin, got to when he talked about how all of the progressive ideologies, fascism, socialism, communism, uh, go down the list, they all try to create a kingdom of heaven on earth. They all try to immunitize the eschaton. Now, uh, I bring up immunitizing the eschaton, first of all, because where other than here can I use the phrase, um, but also because when Bill Buckley ran for mayor of New York City, his supporters had buttons that read, don't immunitize the eschaton, um, and people wonder why he didn't win that race. Um, but all immunitizing the eschaton means is trying to take what is reserved for the afterlife, trying to take what is reserved for the hereafter and bringing it down to the here and now trying to make this a perfect world. As we know, as anybody, as someone who's worked on the victims of communism certainly knows, anytime you try to create a heaven on earth, you're more likely to take a shortcut to a hell on earth because you're gonna end up killing, all, killing or smashing all of the square pegs that don't fit in your preconceived round holes. And this is what I'm talking about, about getting, about comfort with contradiction, is that a conservative and a libertarian understand that there is no way of making this a perfect world, and that's okay. The trick is to make this a good world and a good society, and that's one of the reasons why conservatives try to protect and conserve the founding principles of, the, of, of this country, because those principles have made us the most successful and wonderful country, literally, not figuratively the way Joe Biden means literally, have made us literally the greatest country in the history of the world, and that's worth protecting and defending. And so that sort of brings me very quickly to fusionism. Um, fusionism, uh, which is sort of what the What is Conservatism essay is about, because that's what the What is Conservatism book is about, and it's largely what groups like ISI and National Review have always been about. Fusionism sounds like a really complicated subject, but it's not. It's actually very easy. All it is is this principle, which still defines National Review, that uh, in order to be a virtuous society, you have to be a, a free society because virtue not freely chosen isn't uh, virtuous, right? If I hold a gun to your head and, and tell you you have to help this little old lady across the street with her groceries, you don't get any credit for helping the little old lady and frankly, I don't get a lot of credit for holding a gun to your head, right? Um, you have to choose to be virtuous for you to actually be virtuous. And this is the essence of fusionism. And it's also a, a great political principle for uniting the various branches on the right. 
because it, it takes in the sort of social conservatives, the religious conservatives, and marries them to the sort of liberty-loving, limited government conservatives. And as a political principle, I have absolutely no problem with it. It has served conservatism very well. I believe in it as a day-to-day -day sort of rule of thumb. But at the philosophical, fundamental level, it's deeply flawed, um, as I sort of point out in my essay. The reason it's deeply flawed is if you, the whole part of the point of conserving traditional morality, Western civilization, ordered liberty, and all the rest, is this fundamental understanding that a culture of liberty, first and foremost, is a culture. And you have to protect a culture. You have to defend a culture. This gets, I mean, I don't, I'm not gonna get into all the immigration arguments and, and all the rest, but when you have right now a society that is openly hostile to Western, or elites and educational elites, they're openly hostile to Western civilization, openly hostile to the idea of assimilation, openly hostile to the very idea of uh, that this country and this society did anything good um, in the last 200 years, uh, you've got, what you really have is a war on our culture. And it's a very problematic thing. There are a lot of conservatives and libertarians who love to argue about economics as if if they win the math argument, they win the argument. Remember last night, Dennis Prager was talking about uh, Jerry Brown and minimum wage, right? Jerry Brown conceded, he just admitted, he openly admitted it, that he loses on the math argument, right? That the minimum wage is in fact bad for the economy, it's in fact bad for low wage workers because it creates a barrier to entry, because the, the actual minimum wage is zero. Um, and, uh, but it made him feel good, it makes his supporters feel good, it makes the union hacks who are like uh, using this as a way to, to rev up their, uh, their contract negotiations, it makes them feel good. And conservatives who just wanna say it's economically inefficient are gonna lose that argument. Because the other side is arguing about morality and playing on people's guilt complexes. And we're saying, oh, well, you know, it's, it's really inefficient and it creates a barrier to entry to the labor market and yada, yada, yada. Um, you have to talk about how the minimum wage is immoral it's fundamentally immoral. It locks poor, uneducated people out of the job market. The reason you have, uh, you know, the reason you have low wages at the bottom is because employers are taking risks on people that they might not otherwise want to hire. And if you tell them, oh no, you have to, you have to pay them, a, you know, through the nose, uh, they're not going to hire people, and that's immoral. And it locks the people the mo who are most in need of, eco of getting on the ladder to economic success out of the labor market. And people who support a $15 minimum wage or a $20 minimum wage are, they may have good intentions, but they're supporting a fundamentally immoral position. And until conservatives and libertarians make, start making those arguments in those terms, we're gonna keep losing. And this gets to sort of the broader problem with the fusionist thing. You know, my, my friend and colleague, Charlie Cook at, at National Review, he's got one of these sorts of, he has a very libertarian position on everything like free speech and all the rest, and he says, you know, uh, there should be no closed questions, right? And he, he def we got into a big argument because he wanted to defend some Holocaust denier right to speak on some college campus. And my view is, no, there are closed questions. Part of the whole point of conservatism is that there are some closed questions, right? Um, you know, for me, pedophilia is bad. We're done. <laughs> you know, we're not going to debate it. We're not going to consider it some sort of Oh, well, you make a good point, and oh, I have, oh, here's my counter, but no. You're 100% wrong. I am 100% right. Done. You know, anyone who's dealt with their kids understands this. There are some questions that we're not going to debate, right? Pedophilia is one. Incest, it's another. Against it, right? I can come up with arguments against it, but that in and of itself is backsliding and a, a sign of failure, right? There is a role for taboo in society, and it's a very Hayekian case for it, right? The whole point of, one of the major points of Friedrich Hayek is that civilization is an emergent property that through thousands of years of trial and error, we figure stuff out. And that's where morality comes from. 
and that there are more, there's more hidden knowledge in simple customs and institutions that we just simply take for granted than we could ever know. <laughs> and so to say that everything should be revisited, everything is, everything is permitted until you can make a rational argument against it right now, is a recipe for unraveling big swaths of Western civilization. And I'm against it. The problem is, is that I haven't persuaded a lot of people. And so you have to have these arguments, and that's fine. Um, and I just want to close. I know I have like 90 seconds. That's about right. One minute? OK. Um, if, you take, if you take the proposition, as I do, that ultimately a culture of liberty is a culture, and it is about these things that we've acquired through trial and error over a very long time, uh, I just want to close on this one brief moment, and I'm doing this as a National Review guy. Uh, there's a great threat that comes from Donald Trump and movements like Donald Trump. Because what Donald Trump is, represents is an effort to change the culture of conservatism to a kind of authoritarianism, unilateralism, big manism, right? Uh, it's inherently corrupting. I don't know if you guys have paid attention in the last, I don't know, six, seven years, but we spent a lot of time talking about how single-payer healthcare is bad. I don't want you to, you know, if you missed it, we did, okay? <laughs> and uh, that Obamacare is bad. We, we, it came up. And I'm just bringing this up as an example. They, a few months, over the summer, they asked Republicans whether they supported single-payer healthcare. 14% said yes. That's bad, but we can live with that, right? They were then told that Donald Trump is in favor of single-payer health care. The number went up to 44%. That is the power of cults of personality. And the culture that Donald Trump is bringing is antithetical to the conservatism and the libertarianism that I've dedicated my entire adult life to. Um, it is, uh, the man never talks about liberty. The never, man never mentions the Constitution unless asked about it, and then he betrays the, the rich depth of his ignorance. Um, he never talks about limited government. He talks about winning. And winning is defined as, as, as basically personally as whatever, however he comes out on top of any conflict. That is not what conservatism is about. But you can see, for good reasons and for bad, how it's changing the culture on the right. And I understand why the left is, has authoritarian tendencies. But I kind of thought that this debate was closed and settled on the right that this was like pedophilia, one of these things that we just didn't debate anymore because everyone agreed dogmatically that authoritarianism, that one-man government, that, that uh, constitutionalism, anti-constitutionalism, that these things were just stuff that we were not going to tolerate. And it's come in in six months in a way that I never imagined it could. And that's one of the reasons why outfits like National Review, we are so fundamentally committed to stopping the guy because we see it as not only bad for America, but antithetical to everything that we've been working on our entire life. So anyway, thank you all very much. It's lovely to be here. Sorry to leave on a downer. Terrific, thanks, thanks so much, Jonah. And as, as Jonah mentioned, uh, you know, we have a comfort uh, with contradiction and a comfort with tension uh, because conservatism is not an ideology. And so just like the authors uh, uh, from the 1950s, uh, we have uh, Doug Bandow to represent the, the case for the emphasis on freedom. So, Doug, you want to come to the podium? Actually, we'll just do it from, here from there. Perfect. Okay. okay. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here at ISI. I've always uh, enjoyed working with ISI. I thank Chris and everyone else here for inviting me. I've always uh, you know, been struck by the fusionism. I uh, read uh, Frank Meyer many, many, many years ago. And as somebody who is a political libertarian but whose personal views are basically as boringly traditional as imaginable. But, uh, I suspect I'm the only person at Cato who's known his pastor for 29 years. And I've been <laughs> at two churches with uh, my pastor, and I know that I've known them through nine kids, and I spend Easter uh, dinner with them. So, I mean, for me, the question of how you mix, you know, very much a kind of a traditional sense of personal and social attitudes with uh, a political libertarian view has is, is mattered a lot to me. A quarter century ago, I wrote a book called Beyond Good Intentions of Biblical view of politics, essentially presenting a libertarian worldview to Christians and trying to get square that circle. Needless to say, I didn't find a lot of disciples, but uh, I, I did make the effort. 
I do think that you know, if we're looking at the kind of the, the issue of fusionism today, there certainly are tensions there. And I think part of that are changes in the world over the last 40 or 50 years, which matter a lot in how we find a lot of, uh, you know, kind of within this broad movement of how people relate to one another. One of it is philosophical. I do think that there's been a change of a transcendent worldview that matters hugely. That, uh, I mean, j just as America's founding, I think we have to be very careful to talk about a Christian nation, but there certainly was a sense of a biblical worldview that even a Thomas Jefferson had imbibed and represented. I think that, you know, 60 years ago, we kind of a debate among, if you want to call them libertarians or the Chaudhoff or whoever, and, and conservatives, everyone kind of came out of that and had a sense of looking at the world and understanding of the moral makeup of human beings and whatnot that uh, really colored the way they reacted to, to one another. There was a moral understanding which uh, everyone shared. And I think that made it easier then for the two strands of conservatism to kind of come together. There was kind of a, a philosophical moral bulwark there that for the most part everybody could repair to. I think today that that is simply coming down. And, uh, and I, I want to emphasize, I think it's coming down not just among political libertarians. I do a lot of Federalist Society talks. I very rarely find conservatives in Federalist societies who, for example, on gay marriage have a problem with gay marriage. I mean, this is a, a transformational change that over, say, the past 10 or 15 years, that I think it afflicts far more than just political libertarians. Many of these are people who otherwise might be socially conservative, say on abortion, might be national uh, you know, security conservatives. Nevertheless, on issues like that, I mean, there's been this horrendous and huge shift that I think you know, is, is something that affects a lot of, of conservatives. The second are the practical issues. That you know, 50 years ago, there were a lot of issues that really did unite uh, libertarians and conservatives, one of which was the evil empire. That, uh, I mean, for the most part, I mean, I worked for Ronald Reagan, that you know, libertarians had pretty much a, as, as bad a view of the Soviet Union as conservatives did. You know, there were some arguments about exactly how to deal with it, but th there really was a unifying sense there that this was an evil empire. It's gone. So the question of what America's role is in the world, I don't actually think we have to be the new empire. I mean, so that uh, suddenly you find this whole question of national security, where you come out in it, what are the threats, how do you deal with it, what's the impact of blowback, just has blown this issue apart in a way that once foreign policy, international issues united, I think today they divide. I think that in the question of uh, <coughs> kind of the size of government itself that uh, you know, to some degree, it, it's a lot easier to have some of these battles when government didn't run everything. That because so much of the stuff would kind of just be out in private community. Who's in charge of moral education? You know, how did you know even public schools? I mean, it, you didn't have a lot of fights at one point over kind of moral education, sex education, a lot of these other issues. But suddenly, all of these things have increasingly become politicized, and they suddenly bring in some of these issues of well, what should the state do? Whose values did the state represent? That suddenly becomes much more complicated. I think that if we're looking towards the future, that uh, you know, statism still should unite us. That to me, statism is a huge threat for it, what, virtue and freedom. That both of these are under siege. And I think to me, Obamacare is the perfect example. My view is that, for example, that the contraception mandate I just look at this and say, this is not a health care issue. It's not the sort of thing you normally would insure. I mean, you insure health, you insure against things, not things you choose. You insure against unexpected major catastrophes. That's not this. To my mind, the mandate is basically the use of the state to go after people you don't like. That from the standpoint of liberal activists, this is the moment, especially to get Catholics, anybody who's too stupid to understand you know, the issue of contraception, you know, and I, I mean, I, I wrote a piece for Huffington Post on this issue. I got a thousand comments. People weren't terribly happy about what I had to say, which is quite critical. But I, to me, the, what we see today is a state that is useful both very practically in bad, doing bad things economically and other practical issues, but also philosophically. And it's an issue that I think should, must still bring libertarians and conservatives together. I think we're always going to have to you know, then deal with these divisive issues and recognize that as a movement, there's a larger thing we are fighting, but recognize within that we will argue over national security. I mean, there are, there are conservatives in this race I would never vote for because of my views of them on foreign policy. I, I'd be extraordinarily dangerous. You want to shoot down Russian airplanes, do not ask me to vote for you. I think that is insane. All right, so I mean, we're going to have some fights there, I think, on national security issues that are very important. We're going to have fights over the issue of using government for moral uplift. I tend to think that you know, one of the reasons we're in this horrible problem in terms of gay marriage and trying to impose this on everyone is, look, 
Conservatives were happy to use the state when they had the opportunity for moral uplift. Guess what? The other side now runs everything. So it's very hard when you've lost the philosophical argument. And I think the issue of this, uh, the gay marriage issue is absolutely frightening in terms of the impact on religious liberty and associational freedom. That we're at a point where we actually go out there and expect people you must affirm a procedure that you view as affirmatively immoral and against your historic, I mean, I, this is, in America, I find this astounding. Now this is an issue, though, I do think that, again, libertarians and conservatives can come together on. Even my libertarian friends who are in favor of gay marriage recognize this is an outrage. And I think that, that we have to look for these issues, and this is one of those things that has to be kind of a, a basic, it's a very basic fundamental issue for anyone who is conservative or libertarian, is protecting these kinds of values. We're gonna have arguments over individual versus communal in terms of at what point you intervene, whether it be economically or other things, for the community versus individuals. And I, and I, I worry a little bit about the, que the closed questions. It was an interesting thing. I happen to think pedophilia is a closed question. The question is, do you try to shut people up? Because what's happening today is precisely this on gay marriage. It is a closed question, we are told. It's done. You cannot question it. The Supreme Court ruling on this was scary where <laughs> Justice Roberts pointed out that uh, Justice Kennedy was kind enough to say you might teach against this, but he didn't talk about exercising your freedom in the kingdom. So I think we want to be very careful then in terms of what we view as a closed question that cannot be questioned, even though we might view it as closed, and how, how we try to, again, have these protective freedoms in there, lest these issues be turned against us. I think we're entering very, very difficult times in the future. I think it's extraordinarily important to try to keep our strands together acknowledging we are going to have some very profound differences. And I lived through these at the Cato Institute. I do not write about gay marriage. Never, I'm pro-life. I do write about abortion. They live with that. Even though I think most of the people at Cato probably are not my persuasion, I do in fact write pro-life. You know, these are gonna be tensions we're always going to be dealing with, and I hope we can, at gatherings like this, we can talk and try to keep this together, because we do have a huge enemy out there that threatens both virtue and freedom. That deserves a round of applause, I think. <laughs> well, you said it so well, Doug, I don't know what you've left for me to say. <laughs> um, but I will say something. Before I do that, I want to thank you, Chris, for the, the plug for our book, uh, A Brief History of the Cold War, which Elizabeth, my daughter, and I co-wrote. And I'm happy to say that we are still talking. <laughs> Which uh, people might have thought might not be the case. So, uh, differences and similarities between the traditional conservatives and libertarians. And I do agree with, with Doug that the primary similarity between traditionalists and libertarians is their opposition to our Leviathan government. It seems to me that uh, Big Brother is not simply watching, he's squeezing the life out of us. And both traditionalists and libertarians cite the warnings in The Road to Serfdom by Hayek and other classical liberal texts that government direction leads to dictatorship. Both respect the U.S. Constitution, that is, the original version, as described by Ed Meese, Antonin Scalia, and others, as a primary document of the founding. Both libertarians and conservatives are admirers of the Declaration of Independence. Although liberals, liberal libertarians, I think probably would wish that Jefferson, when listing unalienable rights, had written life, liberty, and property, and not life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What about primary difference? <coughs> I think the primary difference between traditionalists and libertarians is the role of government in a time of crisis, whether that's a military or an economic crisis. Most traditionalists, at least at the beginning, were for the Afghan and Iraq wars, though not for nation building in either. Almost libertarians oppose both wars, and indeed oppose all wars, including the war against drugs. Uh, similarly, with regard to the Great Recession, most traditionalists reluctantly endorse TARP 1. Why? Believing that a failure to act by our government would have precipitated a global panic and a global depression. 
Most, if not all, libertarians felt that the banks and other financial institutions deserved to fail, and no resuscitation was called for. Now, Doug has made reference, I think properly so, to this issue of, of gay marriage. And that, <clears throat> it seems to me, though, is a, not a primary but a secondary difference between traditionalists and libertarians is their attitude about so-called social issues, primarily abortion and LGBT rights, with traditionalists insisting that the family, the family is the essential building block of human civilization and must be given first place in society. And libertarians asserting A, that the woman is aborting a fetus and not a baby, and B, gays and their compatriots should be accorded the same rights as everyone else. I think where we come together is, as you say, where somehow these rights for gays and lesbians and the others should be given more importance, more standing than the rights of everyone else. With regard to the, the unity, and then Joshua talked a lot about this, with regard to the unity between traditionalists and libertarians that Frank Meyer wrote about, well, first of all, um, the two sides were not as united as Frank suggested. There were some tensions all the time between the two sides. And the one guy who kept them together was, at least on National Review and therefore nationally in our movement, was Bill Buckley. Who worked con he was a master fusionist. He was a master diplomat who would go to the libertarian, like, like Frank Meyer, and he would say, Frank, Russell Kirk doesn't hate you. He wants to work with you. Please, let's, let's get together. And he would go to Russell, and he would say, Russell, you know, <clears throat> uh, go, to, go to, to, to Frank and say, you know, Russell doesn't hate you. So back and forth, trying to get both of these guys to come down and work together, cooperate. But the, the, the solvent, the, the guy that made it work, was, was Buckley. Without him there, it would not have worked. And of course, the, the glue, the cement, the, the salt, whatever you want to call it, that, that kept them together, libertarians and traditionalists, was a clear a present danger of Soviet communism. And that disappeared, and no equal threat has yet appeared, although we talk about Leviathan State, and I think in foreign policy, Doug, would you agree perhaps that if there was another 9-11 horror that might help <clears throat> to bring together libertarians and traditionalists? Certainly, I believe there's a reason for the difficulty it is to bring together these two sides, and that is the absence of charismatic principled leaders like Ronald Reagan and Bill Buckley, who made us see the error of our self-centered ways. So I think fusionism is possible. I think fusionism is here, but it takes a lot of work, particularly in the absence of that clear and present danger and the absence of the right kind of leadership. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Jonah, Doug, and, uh, and Lee. And uh, when I was kind of preparing for this, I, I came across, we've got a wonderful library and I've got a, uh, I'm blessed with a wonderful office full of great things. And I came across this uh, September 24, 1960 uh, edition of National Review Magazine. And uh, that was the first uh, 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 magazine, the first edition that came out after the September 11, 1960 meeting at Bill Buckley's house in Sharon, Connecticut, uh, where Stan Evans and uh, uh, the leaders of the day, a lot of ISI students, and, and, and Lee Edwards was there, uh, drafted the, the Sharon Statement. And as we read about, there's really, you know, Bill Buckley himself said in the essay that you read, uh, it's very difficult to define conservatism. But if there is a, a credo or a simple definition of conservatism, it really is the Sharon Statement. And uh, Bill published the Sharon Statement and talked about the, uh, the importance of young Americans for freedom uh, in this, uh, in this, in this copy, and, and here's what Bill said, which ties into what we uh, were just, uh, what Lee just said. Uh, and this again, September 24, 1960. In 10 years, much has happened. History proved the irrelevance of liberal doctrine. The critique of liberalism has been made, if not definitely, at least sufficiently. And it is a total 
critique. The word conservatism is accepted both by Russell Kirk and Frank Meyer as designating their distinct but complementary, even symbiotic, positions. So on this issue of, uh, of symbiosis, uh, we have heard uh, that there is some commonality in, in tying together what we heard last night from Dennis Prager. Uh, Jonas spoke eloquently on it, and also both uh, Lee and Doug brought it up. This issue of transcendent truth, and one of the issues that brings that to light today is this issue of gay marriage. And so I guess you know the, the question I would ask is, how do we as conservatives and libertarians and fusionists uh, bring this, this question of the transcendent uh, this Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, how, how do we do a better job of bringing that about and, and having, uh, uh, having that inform our political dialogue and discussion? Are you going to me here? You, 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 where, where would you like to start? <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, the short answer is, I don't know. Um, a slightly longer answer is, I, I think I'm sort of with, with, with Doug on this, is that when I hear the idea of the federal government trying to impose conceptions of the transcendent order on the citizenry, it makes me want to flip the safety on my rifle. Um, and I think that, in part because I just don't trust the federal government to be able to do anything of the sort. The government, remember, as my old friend, late friend Andrew Breitbart used to say, Politics is downstream of culture. And so, so much of what we need to do about restoring a respect for the transcendent order and all of that has to happen uh, first at the educational level, at the cultural level, and then the government will be a lagging indicator of all that. I do want to say very, just very quickly, I think the way you, I mean, I've done a lot of panels about libertarians and conservatives, because um, I'm so cool. And, um, uh, Almost invariably, we get into these big hammer and tongs fights between the conservatives and libertarians, and then some, you know, propeller beanie intern with a Friedrich Hayek tie <laughs> raises his hand and says, uh, "Excuse me, sirs, uh, isn't it true that if we just went back to the federalist system of enshrined in our constitution that pushed most government decisions down to the most local level possible, wouldn't this solve all of your objections?" And the libertarians and the conservatives, we sit there for, in silence for a second and say, yeah. Because, and this is, this is the great compromise that satisfies the, the battles between libertarians and conservatives, is if you push everything down to the most local democratic level possible, you let the most people live the way they want to live. And one of, the, you know, and one of those ways is conservatively. Right? So that means in South Carolina, if they want to live, you have to protect basic civil war rights, right? We fought a civil war, we amended the Constitution a couple times, so that's, that's a closed question. Slavery can't come back. I'm not going to debate it. Um, but beyond that, let people decide. And so on gay marriage, I have problems with gay marriage. I've sort of come around on gay marriage. I think marriage has much bigger problems than gay marriage. Um, but if you, let, if you push this down to the most local level possible, it lets more people live the way they want to live, and more importantly, or just as importantly, at least the winners have to look the losers in the eye the next day, right? At the soccer, at your kid's soccer game, at the supermarket, if you had a big local battle about one of these issues, whether it's gay marriage or something else, you have to live with the people you were fighting against. And that gives you a certain humility and appreciation for the other side and understanding that you live in a community. What I think unites conservatives and libertarians is the horror at this idea of one size fits all government from Washington, where the government gets to impose values on 310, 320 million people in diverse communities. And that's what uh, freaks out both conservatives and, and libertarians, because invariably in that kind of context, it's very unlikely that the value system that's gonna be imposed from Washington is going to be our value system. Better to have let people live the way they want to live in their own communities and have arguments. And if they lose those arguments and they're sad about it, well, I will break out my tiny violin and I'll give you one piece of advice. Move. There are places that will suit anybody's personality and tastes in this country. Move there. And let people live the way they want to live. Great. Thanks, Jenna. I don't, I don't see a political answer to the question of the transcendent. I mean, it was hard enough to try to get agreement in 1800. 
trying to get agreement. We, you know, we live in just a much more diverse society. A society, it's much less church. It has a lot more people from different uh, you know, faiths, Hindu, Muslim, Baha'i, I mean, any number of others, and also a lot of people who, I mean, now proclaim themselves to be at least agnostics, if not atheists. So trying to get some kind of a, a universal understanding can be really rough. Uh, and look, I, I, have this, I mean, I, I t when people bring this up, I always ask, well, so we want, what, uh, Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich and uh, Denny Haster to teach us morality. <laughs> we want them running policy that's going to make America a more moral nation. Please forgive me, but no thank you. I mean, I always got frustrated you know, with Republicans. You know, they're on their second wife, and they're lecturing me about you know, morality. It's like, wait a minute. Stay married if you're going to start telling me this stuff. I mean, so I think we want to be real careful you know, and I, I even look at, I mean, I remember years ago a good friend who's very active, and all of you would recognize the name if I told you, who was very happy in the Reagan years they were going to have a vote on school prayer. And I went up to this person who's not particularly faithful religiously, and I said, well, you don't really want this, come on. And he said, oh, no, but it'll be great because it'll get the evangelicals all upset and they'll go out and vote. Right? Very practical-minded. I understand that as a political opportunist, but I was horrified as an evangelical myself. It's like... You know, all of my friends in church are being manipulated by somebody like you. So I'm going to be real careful with that. And the second thing is, who's going to win? I mean, my fear is, the, I mean, the problem is we've lost this battle. Because, part of it because it's not just a political battle, it's a judicial battle. And I mean, the courts have, I mean, completely gone the other side. So that, uh, you know, trying to win this back, the transcendent, politically, I think is extraordinarily difficult. I feel, again... The issue, for example, of what do you do on gay marriage? We're not gonna, I don't think that's going to turn around. I mean, it struck me there's a generational shift there that is absolutely huge. That I think the way to win that at this point is to say, leave us alone. Look, if somebody doesn't want to bake a cake for a gay wedding, leave them alone. There are plenty of bakers. I mean, there are plenty of photographers. You know, this, this is conscripting people. We, so we've got to kind of shift the battleground. Someone recognize, look, I think somebody, I, I do think there are cultural aspects of the cultural war we can win. I think abortion is one of them. I mean, my libertarians have always been divided on this. There's always been a very active libertarians for life, long uh, led actually by an atheist woman. I mean, it's very, very interesting, Doris Gordon. You know, my view is simply, look, I mean, it's human life. And look, I tell people they don't like it, but other than rape, if you choose to have sex, you know, you know babies can show up, right? And if, then if a baby shows up, maybe you have some responsibility. We can argue about what it is and I mean, Trump jumped into this kind of, uh, typically, you know, kind of, what do you, how do you penalize? But it strikes me, these are the kinds of issues where I think we have a chance that we can talk about not so much it's just purely Judeo-Christian, but this is a broader sense of human life. Do you respect human life, dignity? You know, where do rights come from? You have to be alive to have rights. I mean, I tell libertarians, it's kind of have, hard to have rights if you're dead. Uh, so I think there are some of these issues we can fight. We're gonna, I think we have to fight at the cultural level. I think the churches have to be involved. This is where, I don't want churches telling you how to vote. I want them to make the moral argument about what animates the society, what's the moral foundation of a good life, you know, that sort of thing. It's, it's a very tough fight. It's scary. Great. Thanks, Doug Lee. I just think we have to take uh, the long view. Some things, some issues are, cannot be solved here and now. Um, in point of fact, uh, public opinion is shifting more and more towards a pro-life, uh, anti-abortion point of view. All the polls show that out. A part of that is because we realize that it could not be an easy fix through a human life amendment, which is what we thought 20, 30 years ago. We realized it had to go by in a much more of a long range and a harder way. And that was to work at the local level, work at the state level, work at the federalist level, and so forth, and not try to have some magic solution from the top. So we're, we're winning. Now, that may take another who knows how many more years and how many more lives will be lost as a result of that, but to take the long view. Uh, with regard to, to gay rights and gay marriage and so forth, well, it, it just seems to me two things. Number one, that yes, um, they should have certain rights, but their rights should not be given priority over the rights of everyone else. It just seems to be a very commonsensical way. And with regard to, to gay and lesbian and all the other kinds of rights like that, well, once the birth rate <clears throat> has dropped down to zero, it might be that people will be able to take a little better attitude about it. And when that happens, HTSL rights will come more to the fore. Those are heterosexual rights. 
Great, thank you. Well, Lee, you mentioned the, the long view, and whenever there is uh, internal uh, conflict in ISI between uh, me and the ISI team, I always tell them we're going to take the long view. <laughs> <laughs> but Lee, uh, Lee, you mentioned uh, you know the family is the essential uh, building block uh, of society, and, uh, and and Doug has mentioned the uh, the individual is the uh, uh, central building block of society. So maybe we could tease that out a little bit. We've got all you know we've talked about all the various strains of conservatism, and we have the Burkean conservatives and the crunchy cons, and we hear a lot about the importance of. Uh, you know, uh, the family and, and neighborhoods and the whole uh, sense of uh, uh, subsidiarity. But, uh, you know, some conservatives have taken it uh, to a new level. They want to kind of check out and, and have their little uh, Tolkienian shires or what have you. So uh, maybe if you could just talk a little bit. What, what is the essential building block of society? How, you know, we, we, we believe in uh, rights are, are given by God, I think, to individuals. But, you know, what is the role of, of the little platoons and and I'd love to get everyone's uh, take on, on some of these uh, things. When, um, when I got this question from you, Chris, it was about, you know, um, does any collective unit of society, the family, the neighborhood, the church, the little platoon, the mediating institution of Tocqueville, have rights or are natural rights bestowed by God merely upon individuals? Whoa, what? So I, I, began, I began reading my Plato, I began looking at Aristotle, began looking at Augustine, began looking at Aquinas, and then I gave up. <laughs> you know, this is, I'm, I'm not a political philosopher, I'm just a poor, ordinary, broken down historian. Uh, and that's, that's a marvelous question, which I think really ought to be taken up by Liberty Fund, the colloquium. But let me just offer a couple of thoughts, and then maybe this is simplistic. And since a conservative unit of society, like the family or the neighborhood, is made up of individuals, it has many, if not most, of the natural rights bestowed by God on individuals. And they include a respect for the other person, the golden rule, a belief in a supreme being as a dispenser of rights, an agreement that reason must govern emotion. And I have to go to Russell Kirk who wrote this in talking about Edmund Burke. Society indeed is a contract. It's a partnership. But it's not a mere commercial concern to ensure private profit, nor yet expressed in the general will of Rousseau. Indeed, men do have rights by virtue of their human nature. But these rights are not bloodless abstractions, nor are they limited to mere guarantees against government. To narrow natural rights to such neat slogans as liberty, equality, fraternity, or life, liberty, property, was to ignore the complexity of public affairs and to leave out of consideration most moral relationships. And one of the most important of the rights which men possess in society is the right to be restrained from actions which will destroy their neighbors and themselves, the right to have some control put upon their impulses and their appetites. And it seems to me that in this passage we can see suggestions of both the traditional conservative and libertarian viewpoint. I don't know if that's going to be of any helpful to you philosophers out there and in this panel, but that's, that's my contribution. Well, th thanks for doing your homework, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, do you have any thoughts on it? Yeah. yeah I, I think that when we think about rights, that there are communal institutions are extraordinarily important. I mean, individuals exist only in community with one another. I mean, you know, every libertarian I know grew up in a family. I mean, every libertarian I know, most of them have families. Neither they do not run their families by libertarian principles, economic principles. You know, they don't send their two-year-old out to earn, the, earn, earn enough money to, to eat at night. I mean, they treat their two-year-olds like every conservative I know treats their two-year-olds. So it strikes me that the challenge is, I mean, I, I, when we talk about communal rights, it suddenly sounds to me very lefty. Right? I mean, suddenly we've gone from negative to positive, and suddenly now it's the, it's the oh my goodness, you know, stick in your favorite ethnic group. You know, are you an authentic representative of whatever the group is, and the group suddenly has rights? And you know, things we've done, for example, say with Native Americans, where you can take kids back who've been adopted. And, I mean, you've created these kind of extraordinary things where some kind of community that in some sense doesn't even really exist but is able to exert itself. So my view is that in terms of rights, you know, 
the only person who will stand in moral judgment before God is an individual. You know, I mean, I, th you know, I think of the, the great scene of the sheep and goats. I mean, there's you know, nobody, you know, there's not a communal sense. I mean, it's what did you do to help those? What did you do to help those who are in need? That doesn't mean these communities aren't critically important. And indeed, you may very well be judged how you treated that community. I mean, especially, I think, the family. I mean, the family is extraordinarily important. So I think that the role of community and communal institutions is very important. And at the very least, government should do no harm. That, uh, to me, that's a very obvious principle to start out, that you don't intrude. I mean, it's certainly an understanding of subsidiarity with Catholic thought. I mean, the, the Puritans talked about different levels of government. Their view church was a government. I mean, they saw different institutions that had very different roles. The civil government should not be out there mucking around, especially federal. I mean, I mean, the notion that the national government decides who gets to use bathrooms. I mean, I have no answer to the issue of transgendered. I cannot imagine the pain people go through who want to do this. So my view is you have to treat this with utter humility and compassion. But the notion that the federal government wants to decide whatever, how, I mean, it's going to tell, you know, 12-year-old schoolgirls that they have to go to the, I mean, this is mo monstrous. So th this strikes me, this is something that's it's not so much a right of the, the community, but there's, there's a role for the community that is being violated. And that the government should not violate that. That indeed, you know, that there are responsibilities there. And I do think that the, the, the family's unique because of the role of children. That you're dealing with, you know, and I think there's an argument for encouraging that institution. We can argue about exactly what that should be and how easy it is, I think, for government to turn encouragement into discouragement. But I think that you know, we're dealing with a fundamental building block of society there. So I wouldn't say that the, does the family have rights? I feel very uncomfortable with that. But it has an extraordinarily important role that we should be very, very careful before we start mucking around with and trying to engineer and transform, especially after it's been created you know, it's thousands of years old and we suddenly have a new conception here. We want to be very careful. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Jonah. Any thoughts on this? Um, I, I'm sympathetic at the same time. I think the circle can be squared by simply saying that we have individual rights as parents to raise our children. And um, as we see fit within broad guidelines, you know, you don't have a right to mutilate your children. Um, but beyond that kind of thing, uh, you know, it's the left that has, you know, one of my, what, seriously, the creepiest, one of the creepiest sentences in American political life was from Hillary Clinton, who said, we as a country need to move beyond the idea there's any such thing as somebody else's child. And um, I think that sentence alone is the justification for the Second Amendment. Um, uh, the, great, the great story about this was, was Phil Graham when he was, he was saying how, um, he was asked by someone you know, what the essence of his educational program is, and he says, uh, the, the first assumption of my educational program is, is that I love my kids more than you do. And this woman says, no, that's not, that's not true. I love your children every bit as much as you do. And Phil Grand shot back, oh, yeah? What are their names? <laughs> um, and so uh, I, I think, you know, and, and Doug's not going to like this bit, but um, my view of libertarianism has always been that it is the single greatest political philosophy for maximizing human happiness. It only has two vulnerabilities, two, two things where it's iffy on. Children and foreign policy. Um, and if there were no children and there was no need for foreign policy, it is outrageous and ridiculous not to be a libertarian. Um, but children and foreign policy bring up arguments about the role of the state and the role of families and the role of society. And um, I think, I, mean, I, 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 I get where Doug's coming from on this, and I, I, I guess I don't believe in family rights either. But I do think that we have inherent personal rights to, have, to raise our children the way that we think is best for them um, so long as we don't do something hideously evil. Great. Wow. Well, we, we, Chris, uh, let me just add a yeah, five minutes. Please. One more yeah. thing come back. Uh, again, uh, quoting uh, Edmund Burke, the true compact of society is eternal. It joins the dead, the living, and the unborn. And we all participate in his spiritual and social partnership because it is ordained by God. Burke reminded the Englishmen of his time of the essential rights of love of neighbor and the sense of duty. And I think those are still essential today. 
Great. Thank, thank you. Well, you know, let's uh, just give the, a hand to the panel.